You're listening to the Surgeons of Horror podcast. Wes Craven, The Early Years, Episode 4, Deadly Blessing. Welcome to the fourth installment of the Surgeons of Horror podcast. Its purpose is to look into the horror films, dissecting them one screen legend at a time. Our first horror legend and focus for this current season is director, writer, producer, Wes Craven, who sadly passed away last year and gave us, the team at Surgeons of Horror Podcast, the impetus to gather ourselves together and look back at his career and the impact he had on the horror film genre. In order to successfully do this, we need a team of horror aficionados who will form the surgical team each episode. So let me introduce you. First up is yours truly, Paul Farrell, lead surgeon and host for the series of the podcast. I'm a self-confessed horror freak who grew up drawn to the dark work of the silver screen and threw myself into that arena, absorbing as much of it as I could with relishing glee. Joining me each episode of the Operating Theatre is a select team of horror aficionados who are at hand selected to perform the surgical task of dissecting each movie. On hand with me this episode is Cheese is Cheese. On hand <laughs> Hi, I'm Cheese <laughs> On hand Cheese I'm Cheese That's it, he said cheese, I'm cheese. On hand with me for this episode is Chief Anethicist and Surgical Technician. Anthony Yee. He's going to delete the cheese bit. <laughs> because he worked so hard on saying anaesthetist. I know, it's bloody hard. I might just call you a surgical technician. Say cheese. Cheese technician. <laughs> Our cheese technician. <laughs> who offers an insightful <laughs> study into the art of celluloid with a keen eye on the slightest of details to narrow in on any imperfections or stuff that just ails his inquisitive mind. That makes no sense and has no relevance to the movie whatsoever. I'm very good at that. Anyway, so I am Chief Cheese. Chief Cheese. You yeah. are Chief Surgeon. I'm, I'm Chief Surgeon. Have you ever done, like, I've heard this, you've done this with the other guys. Yeah, go on. Um, you've just been tempted to, like, you give yourself a paragraph. I am Chief Medical Surgeon, blah, 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 do this, blah, blah. And with me is Ben. Ben. And Miles. So I'd, I'd, I think you should do that. Maybe I will. Say, and with me, the other team is Ant. And we've got Ant. <laughs> yes! <laughs> That's funny. No. Yeah, if you want. Yes, do that. Strip you of any towel if you want. Is our janitor. Is your podcast. <laughs> and these are up the slops. I am. And these are do you realise? Yeah. Like, they sit and they put a mask over your face. That's, yeah, that's six years of medical school. But. I get paid a fucking bomb. I get paid a bomb. I, I played in the cricket team with two of them. And, um, yeah, they get paid a bomb. But when Speaking you get to. Things putting people to sleep, cricket. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I was there. Oh, I. <laughs> so, um, but the thing is, without those guys, you die. So, kind of. Of course, one. man. Yeah. So, if yeah. you're going to medical school, yeah. why wouldn't you apply for that job? Yeah, man. Why not? You want me to do that now, do you? No, well, no. I was thinking, is that, I mean, you know, the gag was you get you know, in a high enough score, your doctor missed out by two points, yeah. you're a dentist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, yeah, yeah. I mean, is that within the doctor culture when you apply? You, you specialise and. Is there some sort of culture that look down on you if you become an anaesthetist? Because it's not real doctoring, but... But, but you say that, but, you know... But would, you, would they turn around and go, well, fuck you, I earn more money or just as good, and I sit down, and you have to actually do the work. Yeah. I just make sure the guy doesn't die. Yeah. I've got to monitor the pulse. Well, it's a serious fucking thing. That's right. Yeah, seriously. Anyway. Yeah. So you're the chief cheese. I'm chief yeah. cheese. <laughs> So this, uh, so this current episode of our podcast is, uh, we're, we're actually looking at the fourth subject in Wes Craven Early Years Sessions, his fourth movie, which is entitled Deadly Blessing. Yes. Um, one that kind of, people may not have heard of, but we'll go, go into detail. I had no that, idea. Of I had no idea he was behind um, Scream, so that's how much I know. Scream. <laughs> was, he, was he screaming? He was screaming, wasn't he? Yeah. No. I'm just playing. Oh, you're just being good. I'm being a dick. Like, <laughs> which is my right as lead host. Um, so, well, as, as is usual, we, we've got a lot of people drilling people in the background. <laughs> so just bear with us. That wasn't me. Uh, it, might, it might be. But they're all asleep, so it's all good. Uh-huh. You did put them to sleep this time, didn't you? I did. Yeah, good. Chief Cheese needs to look after that. Mm-hmm. So, as is always the case, we go into the nuts and bolts by uh, talking through the plot narrative uh, that I like to call the journey. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll kind of talk through that, interject, talk, talk shit along the way, um, before we then get into the characters of the piece, uh, maybe a few director's notes, and then our final verdict. 
So the film opens with like a lot of chanting and skills, and there's these uh, skills, I should say, of Amish-looking people, mm-hmm. who in this instance are called Hittites. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is a narrator that describes a gruesome secret protected for years by generations. Uh, there's a close-up of uh, a guy called Isaiah, who is played by Ernest Torgnine. Oh, okay. Um, it's been a while since I've seen this film. <laughs> you can yeah, make anything yeah. up, and I go, oh, yeah. And then a rabbit comes out and eats in one's toes. Oh. What do you think of that? Um, the toe rabbit. In the fields, yeah. there's this tractor that's being pulled by a character called Jim, who is waved down by his oh. wife. They kiss. Yeah, okay, come down. Yeah. None of it's struck any familiar. We're then introduced to Faith, who is painted. Uh, this I remember. Michael William, who uh, is a simple man played by Craven regular Michael Berman, he sneaks up on Faith and he keeps saying, Incubus! <laughs> um, it's kind of disturbing because he was, it was like a. What was he doing? It was like a sexual assault in the middle of the field. Yeah. It's yeah, so, one of those, uh, I guess, within a tight, uh, tight knit community, you try and sweep it under the carpet when oh, okay. there is somebody that's. Um, uh, well, he's mentally inflicted, you know, so, but they're supposed to be, uh, God's children. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cool. So she's pissed off from her. It's coming back to me now. She's pissed off and her mum comes in. Yeah, that's right. So, like, so he's kind of chatting to us a lot. Jim comes up on the tractor and he that's warns right. him away. Now, Jim was the dude from the Dukes of Hazard. No. Wasn't he? No, full guy. Oh, a full guy guy. But no, there was two of them. There was two deputies. Um, Dukes of Hazard, Enos, who was the simple one, but there was another one who was... I'm pretty sure there was two of them. I what is his IMDb page? I, I, I looked it up. I'm looking it up while we're talking, but I'm pretty sure you'll find he's the full guy guy. I definitely he's the full guy guy. He is definitely that guy. Um, anyway, so he comes up on the tractor while you're looking that up. Yeah. He comes up on the tractor and uh, warns uh, William away. Face mother Louisa turns up and thanks Jim, who mentions that his wife is pregnant. Uh, so he's sort of painted straight away as the hero, yeah, the square jawed hero, because he, right. he takes control of the situation. And the mum hits on him, or it looks like way she's very flirty. Yeah. She's very, very flirty. Yeah. yeah, she's one of those milfs. Yeah, because the daughter is not that much younger. The daughter's about twenty odd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah. So um, and then <laughs> William's still shouting and give us an. He's running up in the background during <laughs> what I call a Paul Farrell scene because I could see easy to see Paul doing this role, just running in the background going. <laughs> Yeah, I could, I could have played with your brother William, I think. Yeah. So, you would have given the part life, because I would have seen you going, Sorry. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, Terrible. John, who is Jim's brother, is then introduced to us, but is soon hounded by his father, Isaiah. Uh, darkness then falls, and William watches Jim pull into the shed, where the latter finds the words incubus painted on the wall. That's right, and he got really upset because he thinks somebody, the guy wrote it, did he? Yeah, yeah. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Jill gives Jim an anniversary present. It's a photo album. And we learned that Jim used to be one of these Hettites. That's right, he's fallen from, from thingy. Yeah. He's a fallen, relapsed Hettite. That's right. The couple retreat to the bedroom and make out. Yes, this is weird because the bedroom is located on the ground floor. Why is that weird? Well, what, if you have a two story house, most people put the bedroom, the master bedroom, upstairs. Yeah. The guest bedroom is on the ground floor, particularly close to the door, which this was. Did you think that was weird? No. <laughs> well, I just, just killed that. Are you, well, like, like, it's weird. If you have a two-story house, like I'm assuming it's a three-bedroom house. Well, how do we know? Do we know that it's two? I can't remember the shot. It's a big house. house. It's, it's a big house. house. It's a big house. It's a big house. Yeah. So I assume it's yeah. two bedroom. Master bedroom usually is built upstairs, right? Right. Yeah. There is a, definitely a bedroom. It's usually the guest kid or the kid's bedroom. Yeah. Because when you get a home invasion, you want the kid to go first, giving you time to get, to get up That's and get out. That's right, yeah, yeah. Get rid of the kid. I just thought it was weird because it was also very convenient because later on... Yeah. Yeah, the cameraman goes through the window. Well, yeah, well, yeah that's right. Yeah. That's right. And, we, and that kind of leads into how we then go to this uh, POV kind of type shot. Um, so the couple are making out. Uh, at the same time, some, we see someone entering the house... Uh, whoever it is watches the couple before heading off again uh, then uh, it looks like it's a little while later Jim thinks he hears a noise and he goes to investigate he goes to the shed to find the tractor's engine ticking over and he sees someone uh, but just as he does so he's then crushed to death by his own tractor this is the precursor to Carrie Bob the tractor now um, sure. I actually thought 
for the first time during the early oeuvre of Craven that this was kind of scary. Yeah. I thought the scene set up well. Even like, like 30 odd years later, 40 years later, it's actually, okay, this is kind of atmospheric. I'm kind of yeah, get a little yeah. spooked. Yeah. The camera work is working, the lighting's working, the pacing, the music. Yes. It wasn't bad. Like, it's, it's kind of aged okay. I agree. This I point, agree. Yeah. This is like, yeah. I think, well, what we're four movies in, and this has mm. been the, I mean, yes, we had a, so Last House on the Left was brute force kind of it's just guerrilla porn, style. Power porn, style. guerrilla style, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. Then The Hills Have Eyes, which is iconic in itself. <laughs> I mean, we've seen remakes of it since then. Um, yep. But, it, you know, it stood out as, as, again, a bit kind of uh, brute force kind of, Attack on a family. Yeah, yeah. And, and then, as you know, when we discussed Summer of Fear, that that's uh, been pared down because of the TV. TV aspect. Uh, yep, 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 yep. But we're getting this is his next movie, and we're getting a, uh, an indication that he's uh, he's getting freedom to create stuff. No, but he's finally starting to yeah, get scary. He's yeah, finally starting to figure out how to. And I yeah. think if you want to, because obviously there were like Last House on the Left and The Hills Have Eyes are iconic films in their own right. Mm. But I think this movie, and this is why it's important, I think, for any horror film fan or fans of Wes Craven to go find this out and watch it, because I think this is the first indication that we get of Craven walking into. What we feel is more t- a, a, a typical horror venture. Yeah, but uh, he's learning his craft. He is. He's learning, he does. Yeah. Mo- yeah. We'll get into those other moments in due course. Um, so, getting back to the, uh, the story, we've we've seen the demise of of Jim, and and you know, Jill wakes up and then discovers he's the grisly scene in, in the ship. Yeah, that's quite horrific. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. and so we're kind of. What was set up to be this, as you as you quite rightly pointed out, mm. man, this hero right, yep. character, he's mm. he's gone within moments. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, and then we go to this, uh, you know, the um, the the, the uh, we see uh, Jim's coffin being buried, Jill standing by the grave, uh, and on the hill in the distance is a small group of those Hittites, uh, including Isaiah, who watch on. And she yells at them or something. Does she? No, I'm thinking, no, 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 no. I'm thinking another film. So I just kind of look at them and mm. uh, the great thing that kind of goes, oh, they always do that for their own kind. Um, I, oh, I do be clear. I don't think he talks like that, it's just me. Um, They're all from Somerset. Two young girls, uh, Lana and Nikki, uh, friends of Jill, decide to pay her a visit. That's oh, right, the best mates. Say bye, Sharon Stone. Sharon Stone, a young Sharon Stone. A young Sharon Stone in her first ever speaking role. And the third one wasn't a redhead. No, there were two blondes. Blondes, yeah. Dark heads. Do you think they would do the redhead blonde brunette yeah. thing? Was that a thing back then, then? I don't know. It's in my head. <laughs> <laughs> it's my thing. Sure thing. But yeah, Sharon, is this Sharon Stone's first film? Not her first film. Her first film as a, with a speaking role. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, they turn up to kind of pay a visit and help out. Uh, William and a group of kids, so William just reminds you, is <laughs> um, a bunch of kids break into the shed. Mm. Uh-huh. Um, Faith's mother um, also uh, drops by Jill's house um, and she appears to be overtly flirtatious again with everyone that she talks to which is yeah. interesting <laughs> um, Jill goes to investigate a noise coming from the shed and at find the kids escape out the window William hides in the shadows and watches her uh, That's right. then Lana and Nikki turn up as I mentioned they were on the way and now, now they're here uh, <laughs> At which point, as William tries to escape from the shed, he loses his shoe. That's uh, right. <laughs> and we also learn that uh, Jim left the Hettites to go to school and was banished when Jill came back with him. So a bit more history about with the background of the characters there. <clears throat> right. Mm-hmm. Jill asks her friends to stay with her, uh, and then William's father chides him for losing his shoe. Not so right. William goes back to find it. Um, it's not about a mortal sin or... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, shoes don't grow in trees or something. Yeah. They do, they do grow in trees. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lana goes to bed, so Shark Chanson goes mm-hmm. to bed and sees a spider crawl out along the ceiling. She feels a bit scared. <laughs> William walks up to the house at this point and he spies on, spies on Jill. Um, why do you keep writing Jill? It's not Jill, her name's Martha. I'm going to make sure I scrap that. Martha. <laughs> uh, she, yeah, he spies Martha through the uh, bedroom window as she undresses. It is then he finds an unsheathed scabbard before he is then stabbed in the back and killed. Oh, that's right, yeah. 
The young man assailant watches Jill go to bed. Ah, uh, Jill, keep saying Jill. Martha. Her name's Martha, isn't it? Is Martha the wife? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going to have to make sure I go back over that stuff. You'll hear it go. Oh, Martha. Martha. Like Can you get your wife to say it? Just to say, Martha. <laughs> go ahead. Okay, so the young man is saying, watches Martha go to bed. Mm-hmm. Um, Isaiah and Matthew, uh, so that's William's father, turn up at Martha's house inquiring about William's disappearance. Uh, Isaiah warns Matthew that Martha is an allegiance for the incubus. Ah, uh, yep. Mm-hmm. And Isaiah wants the land back from Martha. Because there was a son. son. Yes, that's right. The girls talk over breakfast. Lana talks of a nightmare that she had of a creepy man who became a spider. I remember this, yep. Nikki pulls um, uh, the curtain back and Faith is standing at the window. Yes, Faith from the beginning of the movie was the girl. The guy who's the incubus, who the guy sells incubus to. Faith comes to the house, into the house, but appears a bit creepy and overbearing. She offers him. Was this the egg thing? Yeah, yeah. She offers him a basket of eggs. Yes. And if Paul can answer this next question, this podcast will stop here. And then she says to them, "I candled them." Paul, what does that mean? Candled them. Candled the eggs. I've never heard. I didn't even pick that up either. There's a big thing about that character. Paul didn't pick up later on. That she, she candled them so they're safe to eat. When you a bird lays an egg, yeah, so you're, you're a bird person. I'm not a bird person. <laughs> <is> basic knowledge. <laughs> when a bird lays, well, yeah, cool. yeah, when a bird lays an egg, um, you candle them, and if you can see through them, they are safe to eat because there's no, it's not been fertilized. There's no growing little bird in there. Oh, okay. Uh, if you can't see through them, or if you see red veins then it's actually incubating a little baby chick. Okay. And you can still eat them, but it's kind of disgusting. Yeah. Because you're committing murder. So she candles them because they're the ones that are safe to eat. Okay. So you know that from your knowledge of rearing birds, right? Yes. <laughs> it's not something that your average punter will pick up on. But you, to go back to what you, mm. the reason why you brought it into the conversation is that you're inferring that this is, and a bit of a spoiler alert, if not, why the hell are you listening to this podcast? <laughs> um, to do with the character faith. Yes. Yes, completely. So basically, she candled the egg. So you, you hold, if you want to do it at home, just hold a candle up to an egg. With a chicken egg, you might need a torch because they're quite big eggs. Yeah. Because uh, it's something you do for little bird eggs when you breed canaries and budgies and stuff. But yes, there you go. I thought that was an interesting thing to say. No, that's the, it's, yeah. it's in, incredibly relevant. Yeah, I'm glad nice. you brought it to the equation. I'm, I'm sorry that I was so dimly not to pick up on that. Hey, you're not like my friend Lillian Wang who thought that eggs got pregnant when... <laughs> eggs got pregnant? When the male bird, to use her quote-unquote, jizzed all over the eggs. <laughs> I swear to God, she's like twenty five. I, <laughs> I know um, that's defamation, isn't it? But fucking funny. <laughs> Hashtag okay. So yeah, so that's what she says. Okay, cool. Okay, yeah. All right. So then, going back to the the story, the, the journey, mm-hmm. uh, we have Nikki now, who's one again. Remind you, is one of the friends. He, she goes off jogging the next day. She comes across a savage dog, and then maces it in the face. <laughs> Fuck you! Um, a kind of interesting point with this, I, I think why I left that in the notes, is mm. because at the moment dogs seem to be a big theme with Craven, with La- um, not the last house, the other one, the Hills of Eyes, mm-hmm. and being the protector, and now they're deemed as a bit of a. Oh, the, the, the other flag, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. And I, I did a bit of a review on QG mm-hmm. as well, um, yep. as, a, as a thing that I don't know, we'll wait and see if it continues to be a theme or not within his work, but I found that. Good interesting in this instance. Um, did, you then, like, did you like Kujo? Just very quickly. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> I, I, it, to me, it's it, it would serve as a short film really well. Right, right. But to drag it out into a feature, it mm. really kind of felt like you were draining the hills a bit. Right. Uh, I thought Dee Wallace was great, man. Yep. Like, she held her own, considering how much it relied on her performance. Um, but the rest of it was... Yeah, a bit mediocre. I remember when it came out in Australia, it was a big horror film, but 
I do too. I'm a huge certainly. Stephen King fan. Like, yeah. I pretty much I've read most of his books, particularly his earlier stuff. Was it? Um, is it in Australia? No. no. That? I'm thinking that. There's one about a pig, a wild boar. Baby? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Kids. It's been heavily edited. Uh, wild boar? I don't know that one. That's interesting. Just the Australians. Razorback or something like that. Oh, I didn't know that. No. Anyway, back to the thing. Okay, so uh, so Nicky meets John, uh, who uh, just reminded me. The younger brother. Oh, yeah. And he's, you got the feeling he's a bit conflicted. Yes, incredibly conflicted. Yeah. Maybe walking the same uh, line as his brother did. Well, he meets a woman with breasts and everything. Yeah, and like, that's... oh my God, it's a bruise. Yeah. Um, and they talk about Jim, um, who didn't have breasts, mm. and the tyrant's preaching of Isaiah. Uh, and a kinship is formed between the two. Um... Isaiah then turns up, and this is where he kind of does a bit of a rant, says, we are the kindred of God, we have no business with the serpents. And he also chides John for his strange ways. Um, we then go to uh, Lana, Sharon Stone. The barn door shuts despite her wedding it open, and she becomes trapped within. All the shutters start closing. This is quite a good scene, this bit. This was just pretty scary, too. Yeah. Um, mm. She, uh, Good use of shadows. That's right, yeah. Mm. The barn door, uh, so I said, is sharp. She's stuck inside. Uh, she climbs up into the attic and finds William's shoe. Um, someone jumps out at her and Lana falls down when all of a sudden William's hanging corpse drops down in front of her. Um, and it turned out to be William. The body yeah. of William. Yeah. So all this stuff, there was, there was a lot more drawn out than what yeah, I was. Yeah, 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 yeah. There was a lot of stuff with kind of stuff in the spider thing came out. I remember that, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of stuff playing on a lot at that point. Um, and uh, so Isaiah and the Hetites come along to collect William's body. Uh, the sheriff turns out and he advises them all to leave. Not the Hetites, as in... Uh, <laughs> the Martha three women. The two women. <laughs> um, Later that night, Martha takes a bath, and as she does so, someone sneaks into the house. They throw a snake into the bathroom, uh, which then finds its way into the bath. And there's then a, a, a shot here, similar to uh, A Nightmare on Elm Street that occurs. Yes, I was noticing a few things. Uh, with the, the shot in, in question that I'm referring to from A Nightmare is where the Freddy's glove comes up between the legs of Martha. Uh, and in this instance, we have a snake. Head come up in between Martha's legs. Bit more. Uh, it was. It was the hand between Nancy's legs. Nancy's yeah, Nancy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so then uh, Martha manages to get out of the bar. She clubs the snake to death with a fire poker. Meanwhile, at a religious ceremony, Isaiah continues to preach. He wants to know who snuck into the shed with William, and a boy does dogs him Leopold, another boy. Isaiah calls Leopold forward, and uh, the boy in question receives a caning. Right, Rogering. No, no, a caning. Rogering, he pulls his pants out. Uh, Nikki sees John in the shop in the next scene. Uh, and then Melissa, who is John's betrothed, sees them flirting. She runs off and John follows. He swears that he won't talk to Nikki again and then he tries to force himself on Melissa, who <laughs> then runs off. <laughs> That's right. Because he's just so horny. He is a horny boy. Uh, Martha and Nikki then do a bit of gunfire shooting practice. Nikki is shit at it, but then when Martha has a go, naturally she's a crack shot. Nice. This is, yeah. Did somebody teach her? I can't remember now. I don't know. I just thought she just picked it up and just shot and she just happened to be gifted. Oh, fair enough. Do you want to talk about how easy that is to be gifted as a... Like, somebody shoots a gun to somebody who has shot a gun and is really crap at it. <laughs> I couldn't tell you. Well, no, that's the case in point. You don't... Is it... Is that a thing? Can somebody Can we, pick up yeah. a gun and be yeah. a natural at it? Do you remember the... Who was the primary producer we worked with that used to work as free answer with Area 51 that, that Ralphie and that liked? Um, English guy, glasses... But he's a primary producer. Stephen Hancock. Stephen Hancock. Yeah. Uh, he and I did. He wear glasses. Doesn't he wear glasses? I didn't think he did, but carry on. No, I'm, I'm thinking because he wore safety glasses. We went to a shooting range in Queensland. Oh, he was wearing yeah. With him and um, the presenter. I saw the results of that. What? The what shoot? Yeah, 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 yeah. And Stephen was a Jedi. Like, yeah, he was yeah. like, don't fuck with him with a gun. Like, he was so English about it. Going, yeah, I don't know what to do. Yeah. And then saying, bang, 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 bang. Eight shots in the, in the centre. And you're like, fuck no. <laughs> and I had trouble hitting the thing. So, yeah, if steven has got a gun and he's mad, um, yeah, don't, don't run the other thing. way. Yeah. So it can be, yeah, because he'd never held a gun before. And I was like, this is embarrassing. <laughs> so, yes, it can That's be, fun. yes. Okay, cool. Just wanted to know. Curious. Mm. Okay, so, um, uh, so, 
Then we go back to Isaiah, and she, he witnesses Melissa coming back looking uh, a bit disheveled. He gives John a lecture and starts to cane him, but John fights back, preventing him. Holds Isaiah the advances John from the parish. Uh, then Louisa, so that's again the, the horny mother, pays uh, Martha a visit. And uh, John, at the same time, catches up with Nikki as she leaves the cinema, which coincidentally is showing Summer of Fear. I don't know if you noticed that on the uh, billboards, which is Wes Craven's film that we spoke about. Last sh- time. Oh, I like that one. Oh, yeah, I didn't notice that. Oh, yeah. okay. uh, Nikki offers to go for a drive with John to talk. Uh, Lana, will, gonna do <laughs> Lana then wakes up in a trance, uh, and her head is being is her head, sorry, is being held down as she opens her mouth. A spider drops into her mouth, and she wakes up coughing. That really happens, by the way. Yeah, it does. Australian, Australians, I don't know if anybody overseas, but Australians will most likely swallow eight to ten bugs in their lifetime. And I, uh, no, not. <laughs> 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 Which is why when you, we, when you take a shit in the morning, there's just legs in your poo. Yeah. Uh, no, in your lifetime, you'll swallow about half a dozen yeah, to a dozen. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Yeah. See, isn't that great that in- Paul English it's is like now the- so acclimatised? He's like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And drop bear. That, yeah, every oh, yeah. time you fall asleep in the woods, don't fall asleep in the woods. Swallow a bear that drops. You always got to take an umbrella with you in the woods when it's dry. Yeah. Um, with the caveat that that's an umbrella you don't want to hold on to because because it's going to get treaded, yeah, but yeah, it does. Um, but they still teach that in schools. The Spider umbrella the umbrella defence against drop bears. Yeah, no, that, no, no, no. you never yeah, you yeah, never yeah, learn it. School, but right. when you got your citizenship, they that was part of the thing, right? Yeah, yeah, that you had to learn that drop bear defence. Um, yeah. Because yeah, your kids came home from school that day and I showed you. That's right. Yeah, that's right. You yeah. did a demonstration on it. Demonstration. So that's that's the thing. Good. Yeah. Anyway, so we're, we've um, cut back to <laughs> the film again. Um, so, uh, where are we up to? So, uh, John has a go at driving the car, so he's out on this kind of... Yes, because that's a big thing for him. Nick, uh, Nicky. Mm-hmm. Um, and he narrowly uh, misses hitting the tree. Um, they make out, and then we cut to Melissa, so that's John's betrothed, waking up saying John's name. She fixes a knife and then heads out into the woods. What a bit weird. Oh, um, this is, she's in the nightgown or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John and Nikki, meanwhile, are back in the car. Uh, they hear a noise coming from the woods. And despite checking outside, John finds nothing. He climbs back in the car and continues to make out with Nikki. <laughs> Suddenly, a knife comes through the roof of the car, stabbing and killing John. Ouch. Petrol is poured over the car, and Nikki tries to drive the car away. Someone lights the trail of petrol, which leaks its way to the car. Nikki tries to make an escape, but the car blows up with her inside. Damn. I think I, can't, I didn't write it down. I said the bungle. I didn't write it down. There was something funny about her last line. I thought. Oh, I can't. Remember. Just because there's something like oh shit or but like oh no. I honestly couldn't remember. I just thought anyway. <laughs> You'd roll out, wouldn't you? Yeah, that was a big thing. It's the whole Charlie's Theron run, run away yeah. in a different direction. <laughs> the spaceship is going to crush you to death. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Here's the thing, though. If you ran like if you like say uh, you next to a building that's collapsing. Yeah, would you have the weather all? Would you? Would you? Would your senses be overwhelmed with the fact that holy fuck, a building is falling on me? Just run. Yeah, and that's all you would think, or would you? Would do you think? I mean, it's an honest question. I don't say that. No, but would you have the weather all to, to to know? Shit. Okay, run left, run right. I'm not going to run straight ahead. I don't think you. Ru- I don't think you know which direction to run. Yeah, because it's because your sense of perspective. Know at what point? Yeah, where the building is going to fall? Because so it doesn't just run. Yeah, that's it. I think and. In defence of Charlize Theron's character, yeah. is that what happened? Because you see, this perspective is so warped because the things take out all your field of vision. Yeah, true. And it's moving slowly, so you're thinking, okay, I, I know it's going to crash me, but it's moving slowly, I just panic and run. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. It's a classic thing, like, you, you can train all your life to know what to do when you, with a shark if you're a scuba diver, and the first time you see a shark, you just might just lose your shit or, well, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. And those are people who are trained for it. We don't train for a building, building falling on top of you. We don't train for many things. I know, not, not that. But I, I was really curious train about that. For multiple hot dog consumption. Yeah. True. Um, <laughs> drop bears. Uh, drop bears. Don't forget drop bears. Hashtag drop bears. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so. She's dead. She's dead. Yeah. She's dead. Sharon uh, Stone's not dead yet. Sharon Stone's not dead. So we go back to her and she pours herself a glass of milk, but blood pours out instead. Lana starts to lose her mind. That's the expression. She spoke to me in a dream. Yeah. Dreams are a big thing with West Craven, as you know. 
Have you heard of that film Nightmare on Elm Street? No. Me neither. We'll talk about that. Jake also. Um, Jill opens a door to see a scarecrow staring down at her. Scarecrows are a scary thing, not just for birds. But yeah, they're, they're iconically. They're, they're the, I've seen the film Husk, which is a recent film. Yeah. Uh, Jeepers Creepers, which is a yeah, great yeah, film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he was, yeah, he's a scarecrow in that. That's right. Um, there are many things that have used it, um, you know, uh, as the film Scarecrow as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, What's that about? Uh, cheese. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, I just found that interesting as a, as a point. But this scarecrow in question, it's uh, it's it's not alive. It's it's uh, dormant. Um, <laughs> it's not it's not it's not um, but it's wearing Jim's clothes that he was buried in, uh, which is an indication that he's been buried up. So Jim, Jill, sorry, Martha then goes to um, Jim's grave to find it freshly dug up, um, but there's nothing in the coffin except a load of chickens. So <laughs> there's no one here except those chickens. Um, is that a coffin? No, just a load of chickens. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Martha then goes to Faith's studio and finds uh, a painting of her in there. Um, she also discovers Jim's body. Oh, that's yeah. So this okay. Who's who's yeah yeah Faith. Faith yeah, the floaty mother. Faith, Faith, Faith. That's a floaty mother, right? No, no. Louise is the floaty mother. Okay. She's Faith is the kid. Faith is the kid. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Faith is um, candle girl. Ma- Ma- candle girl. Martha sees Melissa roaming and ranting outside, and Louise comes out and attacks Melissa. So the mother comes out and attacks Melissa. Yes. Faith then uh, gets attacked by Martha. <laughs> oh, no, sorry. So they, Faith then attacks Martha, who defends herself by hitting Faith over the head. And it's uh, then we learn that Faith is completely infatuated with Martha and is, in fact, a boom, 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 a guy. Something, <laughs> something that went over the head of a certain film reviewer. <laughs> <laughs> The actual guy who set up this podcast and was actually a fan of the guy's work hit me with the quote, what the fuck are you talking about? When I started talking about transgendered, blah, blah, blah and it's like... Totally missed that. Completely missed it. It's, it's an effect that, admittedly, I don't know if that was for the rating, but it was just shot really badly. Yeah. But she rips open face top blouse. Yeah. And was <laughs> just like... It's just flat chested, but there's hair, there's, there's body hair. I didn't see the body hair. Yeah, I have to admit, I and it is poorly shot. Flat, flat, flat chested. Chested, thank you. Um, so but, yeah, totally missed that. But as, as a, but, but is, is Wes Craven really known for the nudity? Apart from obviously the Last House on the Left, I'm guessing had a bit of nudity in it. I, I had nudity in it, but no. Yeah, see, it, yeah, for me it was it was odd because it looked like a prosthetic, which it was. It was a prosthetic yeah, to make her flat chested, and it had hair. But you had to, yeah, if you blinked, you missed it because it was really poorly shot. Yeah, I, really did, I honestly didn't pick that up. Obviously, you went back and went, oh no, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. But yeah, that's the only time it's referred to openly, too. Yes, yes, that's right. So basically, Faith is a guy. Faith is a guy. Yeah. yeah. And that makes sense why she's been fighting with these feelings towards Martha, trying to resist it because her mother is saying that she's a, a girl, mm. when deep down she's a guy. Yes. Um, so what I'm saying, so uh, Martha gets back to her house, but someone tries to break in through the front door. Martha shoots at it. She then tries to call the police, but then Faith smashes and opens the door. Martha shoots Faith to the ground. And they're quite... I seem to remember kickback. She kind of was like... Yeah, like a, yeah the classic cable... Yeah, that's right. Effect. Uh, Louisa then opens the front door, brandishing a shotgun. She fires and misses. A fight breaks out between the two, and just as Louisa raises a candlestick to crash over Jill's head, Lana Martha turns is... up and shoots, killing Louisa. Yes. Uh, Martha then finds blood on the floor and then sees M- Melissa. So just to remind you, that's... John's betrothed, the one roaming around yep. in a nighty With a knife. Uh, she's standing there in the doorway with a knife. All of a sudden, Faith comes in, Martha, with a knife, but Melissa turns up and stabs and kills Faith. Isaiah then appears at the doorway and tells of how the message of the incubus is dead. The next scene is daytime, and Lana leaves escorted by the sheriff. Martha has chosen to stay. She goes back to the house... And when all goes dark, Jim's ghostly spirit appears mm. and says, Beware the incubus. And then he fades. The house shakes, and a demon like creature rips through the floor, pulling Martha into the ground. The light returns and lights over the floorboards back to normal. 
We hear Isaiah's narration at the end about the evil of the incubus with closed credits. Dumb. So that ending. The seed of that, obviously, comes up later on. Yeah. In his body of work. Yes. It's a very Wes Craven move. It is. Later on. And we'll talk about that particular ending in a bit, uh, I think, towards the end. So um, let's, uh, we've kind of talked through the, the body of the piece. Let's uh, let's take a quick look at the, the characters, the actors that play them up. I have say a few thoughts about good shit. Mm-hmm. Uh, around them. So the lead is Martha, mm. played by Marianne Jensen. Now she was known playing Athena from the original Battlestar. Yes, yeah. she's one of those famous eighties faces. That girl. Yeah, yeah. She's pop TV. That's loved did a lot of TV shows. That... I often got her confused with whoever the lady was that played the lead in uh, Buck Rogers. Though. Wilma, the woman playing Erin yeah. Gray. Erin Gray, thank you. Oh, okay. So uh, I, not because they look alike. They don't look I, like. think, I think I just confused both. They are part of that, that, that television. There's like the television company that dominate a lot of American yeah. Yeah, yeah. productions. So, yeah. But yeah, no, she's a classic ladies. Oh, that girl. Yeah, that's right. Yes. She, she also appeared in uh, Love Boat uh, for a period of time and uh, Beyond the Reef. Her career was cut short by illness after she contracted Epstein Barr syndrome. Because so, I did think, like, until I was looking up uh, stuff about her, I was like, well, what happened to her? Yeah, so, yeah. Battlestar was such a huge vehicle. She would have gone on to bigger and better things. But this deadly blessing would have been her final uh, media appearance. It lies dormant until stress or illness upsets the immune system. It's like glandular fever. It causes glandular fever. That's probably what it knocked her out. So you probably caught cop- that on top of that. Oh, there you go. Okay. So then, obviously, uh, we need to talk about Sharon Stone. Uh, He's cheap. Plays Lana Marcus. Uh, first speaking role in the movie, as we said, at the head. Uh, after playing roles in Remington Steel, Madam P.I. and T.J. Hooker, she would feature as Jesse Huston in movies King Solomon's Mines and Alan Quatermain in The Lost City of Gold. Uh, she appeared in Police Academy 4, Citizens and Patrol. Seriously? <laughs> yeah. Uh, eventually, she would take on the role of Laurie in Total Recall. Uh, she was starring He Said, She Said, before turning heads in Basic... The most famous role she's ever known for. Yeah. Um, Sharon Stone would also star in Last Action Hero, Intersection, The Specialist... She had a cameo in Last Action Hero. Yes. She was good. Quick and the Dead was good. Yeah, was. I enjoyed that. Sam yeah, it was, yeah. And um, Russell Crowe. Essentially, Crows. the highlight of her career was as Ginger McKenna in Casino. I have not seen Casino because it's a gangster film. You know, I don't do those. You're me. Have you heard of this thing called The Godfather? No. Uh. Um, you missed out because you're very good in that, I have to admit. Uh. Did you know there was a Basic Instinct 2? Because yes. I totally missed that. I didn't know that. But is she in it? Yeah. And he's in it too again, isn't he? The no, Baldwin. It's David no, Christie. somebody else, yeah. Friday, Baldwin was. Baldwin was Sliver, wasn't he? Baldwin. The Baldwin was Sliver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never saw Basic Instinct. I saw uh, the scene. So in this movie, um, you do get the impression that she, if you kind of, I mean, she looks very young in this. Yeah, she could tell. You can see that she, was she a model? Yeah, she came. Yeah, across. she came across as a model, but trying to be an actor. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but interestingly, the attention arguably is more focused on Susan Bre- uh, Susan Buck. She kind of has it's something more substantial to do. Yeah, character. Yeah. So, um, which again, like she. Like she was known um, as playing Croftet, one of the Croftets in the Brady Bunch Variety Hour. Okay. Um, but it, like weirdly, I saw this and went, uh-huh. um, mm-hmm. she was more known for playing Patty Simcox in Greece. Oh, really? Which made, I mean, obviously, she's really dolled up to look kind of nerdy and with the big glasses yeah. and, and all that stuff. But yeah, that's her. Um, but like uh, Marin, um, she disappeared from the scene after Deadly Blessing. Not due to illness, just... Uh, just had enough. Yeah, it was, was There's it? a lot of actresses out there, actors. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of actresses too, I guess, who just say, not nah, turn their back on Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. Which, um, for me, is a would-be horror film director would want me to entice them back into the fold. <coughs> okay, the answer, they're good, yeah. Oh, yeah. For screen testing. Um... Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so then let's. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, they're both those uh, characters, Lana and, and Vicky, are there to kind of. are there for the sport role, essentially, to. Yeah, looking at a female. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah it's a horror film. Um, I did question, like, I did find her death scene a bit. Uh, yeah, um, it was a bit. 
But that side, um, all good. So Jeff East, uh, who plays John Smith, we've seen him before, uh, if, if, if I can remind you, in Summer of Fear and uh-huh. um, in our <laughs> West Cave in early years discussions, uh, he was the brother in that. Uh, as mentioned, oh, yeah. he also appeared in Huckberry Finn, uh, in the Tom Sawyer and Huck movies, played the young Clark Kent, as we discussed in Superman. Oh, is that him? Yeah, yeah with the black hair. Oh, I thought his face looked familiar. And starred in, you said the same thing about in the Summer of Fear discussions. Did I? Yeah. Oh, my and, God. And he also starred... Is that him? As, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he also starred as Chris in the Pumpkinhead series as well, the Stan Wilson movie. See, with the blonde hair, he looks like Will, uh, you know, the greatest American hero. Believe it or not, uh, that guy. Yeah. Uh, Hinkley. No idea who you're talking about. I'm just going to agree. Yeah, well, you just think greatest American hero, right? Believe it or not, I'm flying on air, walking, walking on air. Oh, yeah. The guy with the blonde hair. Yeah, yeah. I would okay, confuse those two because they're about the same era. No, you're right. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah I, I get it too. Mm-hmm. I actually liked him in this movie. I have to admit, I, at least he had something to I, do. Exactly, and mm-hmm. I liked. Mm-hmm. I mean, because he's conflicted as yeah. well. Yeah, and I, and I found there was something interesting about that character. Actors love that. And shit. Particularly the bit, exactly, mm-hmm. and particularly the bit where he he. Uh, forces him himself or tries to force himself on Melissa's character because hmm. um, that thing for me just highlighted how repressed he is yeah um, and yeah I thought I thought he was good and of course you know when you're uh, leaning towards uh, the sinful act of sex you have to be killed so it had to be done yeah, is that rule? Was that rule? Who? Which film I can kind of establish that rule? Friday the Thirteenth. It was Friday the Thirteenth. It was. That was. Yeah. A, that was the first one. Based on what happens in Halloween. Ah, okay. So it's a John kind of started. No, it. Friday the Thirteenth did it. Halloween. Halloween had the whole. The prototype the whole, version was yeah, from yeah. John. Yeah. Like Victor Miller, who wrote Friday the Thirteenth, went to watch Halloween. I went, all right, that's, these are the rules that you need for a horror movie. Yeah. And then wrote Friday the 13th. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the rest is history when it comes to the whole, mm-hmm. you should not have sex. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's talk about uh, Melissa. So played by Colleen Riley, purely because uh, she, of sorts, is another uh, Craven regular. We will see her again in The Hills Have Eyes Part 2, playing the character of Jane. She also appeared in a movie called Space Invaders. What's that one? Uh... I think it's a film. Well done. About uh, Space Invaders. Martians. That sounds familiar. Martians that land um, on Earth at the same time as the Orson Welles uh, radio broadcast of World of Worlds happens. Okay. Is I think it fun? that's the movie from memory. Okay. Okay, Doug Spar, who plays Jim Schmidt, um, we've already said he's played Howie Munson from The Fall Guy, and not, not, not Dukes of Hazzard. Someone in Dukes of Hazzard, but he looks a lot like the guy. Um, but yeah, The Fall Guy, um, and he's not the guy, so basically The Fall Guy, so we're not talking about the Lee Majors character, he was like the sidekick character in mm-hmm. that. Um, Dukes of Hazzard, no, definitely not. Um, he's not in it very long, we kind of, he sets himself up as the old American kind of guy, he gets cut off very early. Um, then we go, let's talk, turn our attention to Lisa Hartman, who plays Faith Stoller. Mm-hmm. She would appear in The Love Boat, Fancy Island, TJ Hooker, and Knott's Landing. As a massive aside, whenever I think of King's Landing, or when King's Landing is mentioned in Game of Thrones, I always think of Knott's Landing, and I cannot <laughs> say the two. And you hear the theme song every time they go to King's Landing. I do. I'm, 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 I'm just like, oh my god, get off of my head. Uh, so it kind of uh, destroys the myth of Knox Landing with me or the legend of Knox Landing. With even, um, King's Landing. King's Landing. <laughs> so, okay. I use the two all the time. Um, what do you think of, uh, of the character of Faith in this? It's a big, big ask to try and be portraying somebody that's a guy that's supposed She's to be a woman. Not at all transgender in the slightest, but at the same time, no, what the hell does that mean? You get away with that kind yeah. of stuff. And that. But also, yeah, we've the first... we that a lot more in recent territory with the stuff like, you know, yeah. uh, the, the Danish girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Uh, He's like... That's a tricky line, isn't it? Because like, well, trans, you know, what is transgender? It's just a yeah. male or female's body. We we live in the Sydney, one of the transgender capitals of the world. Yeah, um, um, I've, I've known a few of them myself. It, look, you know, it's a very tricky political area. Yeah. But as a misdirect, because that wasn't as big a thing yeah. back then. Um, sure, but the reveal, as we've established, was so piss weak. It, a lot of people missed it. So it's yeah. kind of a weird. Weird, weird thing. So, 
best to see it clear because it's a political minefield. I agree. But I, agree. Um, I thought it was weak because purely because people missed it. Like me. Yeah, the That's big right. twist. No, yeah. I did. I completely missed that. But, you know, it was all good. Um, but well, on, on hindsight, when you look back, uh, when you look back at it, I, I kind of did think to myself, um, actually, that was actually that was actually quite a, a good premise of the story. Mm. I just think maybe the execution wasn't pulled off as, as well as it could have been. Yes. Um, so yeah, all good, all good. In that respect, um, and then we have okay, then we have um, Louisa Stoller, the mother, played by. Uh, Lois Nettleton. She would star as Lucille Ballard in the TV movie adaptation of Meet Me in St. Louis. Mm. Uh, the Twilight Zone, The Abbot Hitchcock Hour, Dr. Kildare, Bonanza, Lady Macbeth in the TV movie of Macbeth, amongst a whole load of TV shows such as Babylon 5 and Seinfeld in more recent history. Oh, really? Um, she's, still, she's still working? Yeah, yeah. Oh, there you go. So, um, a, a huge, uh, I'm made many TV work. Um, and plays that kind of like, you know, the, again, it, it's a very much about sex and repes- sexual repression. It's mm. a big theme that's, mm. that's uh, rolling through this movie. Um, and you get that feeling that she's the trapped kind of housewife. Yeah, she was like a porn cliche. Yeah, yeah. Um, she just wants to have sex. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, and of course, because of that, has to get her comeuppance. Mm. Uh, the skirt around the, 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 the big uh, white elephant in the room, though, is in that uh, Isaiah Schmidt, played by mm-hmm. Ernest Borgnine. Um I'm going to literally, so this is a list, and I apologise, because mm-hmm. he's so big on the, on the Hollywood film circuit. Um, he probably came to attention more so playing Sergeant Fatso Judson in From Here to Eternity, uh, will crop up in Vera Cruz, Big Day of Black Rock, uh, the played the title of role in Marty was uh, in the Vikings, not the TV series that we all know now. The uh, one back in the 1970s, I think. Um, the flight, the original flight of the Phoenix. Ah, uh, oh, good movie. Played Lieutenant Commander Quinton McHale in the TV series McHale's Name. Yes. General Warden in the Dirty Dozen. Mm-hmm. Uh, Boris Yas- uh, sorry, Boris Baslov in Ice Station Zebra. Played Dutch Engstorm in the Wild Bunch. Uh, uh, was in Willard, uh, played Rog Rogjo in the Poseidon Adventure, was in Convoy, played Harry Booth in The Black Hole, which to me is still one of the <sighs> biggest sci fi films ever. Has, the, the, I think, one of the most iconic um, shots, clever shots in all sci fi history, which is that meteor barreling down the spaceship and the people running across the foreground. Yes. The sense of scale and the detail, and it's just epic in nature and just. Well, the sense of danger has a one shot, yeah. it, and it just looks good. It's yeah, it's, it's really. It's I still really cool shot. like that movie. I, I'm one of the few people like the movie too because I thought Vincent was really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. everybody hated him. <laughs> the filmmakers hated him. He just was not because it was, he was disnified because he was supposed to be a very different looking robot. Yes. But I thought Vincent and Bob were funny. I yeah, they, I, I did. They were a cool double act. Yeah, I liked it. I yeah. Liked it. Um, he was also uh, involved in uh, played the role of Cabby in John Carpenter's Escape from New York. Yes. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Um, which we definitely we we'll want to talk about. Mm-hmm. Uh, he appeared in Airwolf, uh, and then uh, more recently cropped up in Gattaca, the sci-fi movie. Oh, okay. Uh, and did the, uh, supplied the voices of uh, Kip Killigan. I'm going to try and pronounce that right. In uh, Small Soldiers. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and also provided the voice of Mermaid Man in SpongeBob SquarePants. Oh, really? Uh, um, quite yeah. a bit of time. Uh, Interesting one, this one too, because he is the he is the uh, the uh, preacher who's uh, a very stereotypical role that he's playing within this. Yeah, the and the weird thing is, is that his prophecies come true at, in the end. Well, that's the the, the thing with these films. You have the the uptight, tyrannical, conservative nut job yeah. who happens to be right. Yeah, seems to work in these films yeah um, which is an interesting dichotomy with films and reality I guess yeah yeah. the nut job is always right um, you yes. know uh, if I lived in a film universe I'd be pro gun <laughs> because in the <laughs> film universe people turn into zombies and bad shit happens to you yeah, 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 yeah real life anti-gun so it's like this pro life real life they are nutbags and nothing more in film universe listen to what they have to say <laughs> 
Yeah. So, yeah, he comes across as a... Well, it's, it's also about, you know, the snake eats tail thing. He brings... Yeah. These boys portrayed him and kind of basically set in motion these actions that he was, he was uh, dreading yeah. because he was trying to stop them from living a life that was going to lead to these actions that, that dread because he's such a... He can't live with him. He's unbearable. Yeah. And, of course... Your kids are going to rebel when you are that fucking uptight about certain things, and of course, causing the very thing that you're trying to avoid. That's right. Which is an interesting um, uh, conundrum that a lot of these sort of characters find themselves in a lot of films, because that's how you start the drama. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and he does it well. Like you know, he, he, you believe him. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh no, he's incredibly believable and hands up every mm. scene that he's in, mm. and you can tell that he's a seasoned veteran. Yeah. Um, you know, doing what? Doing it for the money. Yeah. Um, the last character uh, I want to talk about is William Blunt, played by Michael Berryman, purely because he's another Craven regular. He was the face of The Hills of Eyes and The Hills of Eyes Part 2 as the character of Pluto. Mm-hmm. He would also star in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, mm-hmm. uh, another voice Craven f- vehicle, Invitation to Hell. Uh, he would be in Weird Science. Um, he was in. He played a Starfleet. The guy. Oh, we talked about this. The, yeah, because he's featured in another film. But really weird Science, he had the line, Let's Do Lunch. Yeah. Which back in the eighties was um, this year's. This is equivalent to I'll friend you on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it was yeah. very funny. Ha 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 ha. And then yeah, Star Trek. He played. He was a Starfleet display officer in Star Trek for the Voyage Home. He also cropped up in um, uh, the Tales from the Crypt TV series, playing a character called Rupert Van Helsing. Oh. He also in the X Files at some point, and would feature in the Lords of Salem. I recently um, saw. Finally, got around to seeing the miniseries, the X Files miniseries that came out recently. Oh, I haven't watched all of that yet. Yeah, I, all, all I got, pretty. all I got was like, how much was David the company phoning it in? <laughs> he was like, I, know, I mean, like Mulder's supposed to be this relatively laconic deadpan yeah, guy because yeah, he's yeah. supposed to be even tempted amongst amongst all the surrounding insanity. But fuck me, he's just <laughs> seventy years old, going just going through his lines. <laughs> uh, Cynical money making exercise. That's it. Because this is like the third X Files relaunch too. Don't forget, people think, oh yeah. my god, they're back. Well, they've, they've been back before and back before that, and then in the movies. Um, there's a lot. I, I mean, we're going off track, but there's a lot I forgot about the X Files. Well, the problem with the X Files is the last two, three seasons, it would like it lost a huge chunk of its yeah. audience because he left. Yeah. And then apparently it went off the rails big time storytelling wise because the stories just made no sense and they just yeah. phoned it in. So there's a whole bunch of characters. The whole problem with the reboot was that there's a whole lot of shit that went on that, like, I mean, for me, I was like, I can't believe they still haven't, like, she still doesn't believe. She still keeps turning her back when a UFO fucking turns up. But he, like, really? <laughs> After all that's gone on, she doesn't think, they still have this dichotomy of, like, you're the believer, I'm not the believer. After everything that's happened. Um, so, yeah, and that was it. It was like, nothing's changed. Yeah. They haven't grown, they haven't developed. Um, it was a bit. It was a bit sad. Sorry, Chrissy. I know she's a huge fan. Um, there's one. I've seen the episode where they had the young version of them. There's, yeah, there's another one that started well, which is a uh, two young FBI agents come in, and the male happens to have short dark hair, is quite good looking, and the female's a doctor who has red hair, and um, okay. and, and they they sort of knock on their door because the the young guy is, is a believer and wants to ask Mulder for advice, and the girl's like, I can't believe you're doing this, and it's like obviously, I mean, the crowd is obvious and. I thought, okay, that had potential because it was kind of funny. Anyway, so yeah, <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that, but um, yeah, the company phoning it in. Yeah, it does. As it does. Um, so let's look at the director's notes. So we kind of talk about some of the aspects of the film. Um, it was one of those films, as I said at the beginning, that, that faded into obscurity. Um, Craven would often speak of this movie as part of his work, but he just got a non plus response. Um, he was initially brought into the project to do a rewrite, which he did, uh, and Craven would talk of Borgdine saying that he was incredibly popular with everyone on set. Hmm. Um, the head sites, as I said, were loosely based on the Amish, but Craven would add that Amish are a lot nicer. <laughs> yeah. um, Craven remarked on how he had a very stern father himself, so that was something that he... A uh, big resonating thing, yeah. Um, it's obviously a less graphic film in comparison to Last House and Hills. Mm-hmm. Uh, the producers, uh, going to the ending of the movie, producers wanted a monster or demon to be unleashed during the tractor death scene uh, uh, a bit earlier on, uh, and he held his gun straight and said, no, 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 I don't uh, want that one to be uh, okay. uh, loop. Um, but, and then whilst filming this movie, Craven, this is an interesting story, whilst filming the movie, Craven lost his apartment in New York, 
Um, well, how do you a friend it? of David Hesse's, who was in Last House on the Left, had been using it, and the janitor <laughs> on the apartment saw drugs and a gun and reported it to the landlords, who in turn kicked Craven out ah. while he wasn't there. So he would return to New York homeless, and it, uh, Cunningham, Sean Cunningham, who he worked with mm-hmm. uh, on Last House on the Left, was in New York, and he had to go and pick up Craven's stuff for him. Oh, right. Uh, the location of the shoot itself, a deadly blessing, was uh, uh, had actually uncovered some, you know, um, top, topography that Craven had never encountered before. So, you know, he's a city kid, so for him, he found that really fascinating. Oh, grass. Uh, yeah. Um, and then the budget was the highest at the time that Craven had ever dealt with. Um, and all the kids that were used in it were uh, local kids. Oh, yeah. Calling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it was like a million dollars? How much was the budget? I didn't write it down, actually. I just know it was more than, oh, yeah. more than he had handled at the time. Um, the bar scene was apparently going to be a shower scene a la Psycho, mm-hmm. but Craven changed this um, because it was too similar. Too Psycho. Uh, in the same scene, Martha <laughs> places a face cloth over her face while mm-hmm. she's bathing. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Craven apparently stole this from the marathon man. Dustin Hoffman does a similar thing. Oh, all right. Kind yeah. of like that. Oh, okay. They were like, oh, that's kind of cool. I thought you were going, he stole it. He stole it. <laughs> he took it out with him. He apparently uh, dreamt the bar scene as well, and which is why he added it into the movie. Uh-huh. Um, he said, uh, dreams are the most common experience that humans have of entering into another world. Uh, yeah. Which is, uh, again, that is a theme that yes. he plays on a lot. Yes. Uh, the scene Have you seen the film Nightmare on Elm Street? That's right. Yes. The scene where the spider drops into Sharon Stone's mouth was actually a cotton ball with elastic bands cut in half. Ah, I did not know that. No. Craven uh, would treat this film like an experiment, interestingly enough. Like you said, he's a man yeah. still learning his craft. Mm. Often having to do little rewrites and improvs along the way. And going back to the ending in question that I was referring to earlier, uh, Craven wishes he could clip the end of the print. Um, he listened to the producer's wishes in this instance because mm-hmm. uh, they wanted a big monster yeah. factor at the end, but he finds it deeply humiliating and is embarrassed by it and apologies to everyone. Yeah, it, did, it, did, well, it didn't need it. No. But at the same time, I thought maybe back then this was film taste being what it was. It was considered a horror. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. It's definitely bowed to the whim of the uh, producers yeah. uh, in this instance. So, yeah, interesting. Um, so, final verdict of Deadly Blessing. Um, it's a fairly clunky film. You know, it has the restrictions to look of a low budget. There is poor effects within it. Uh, strict production values, all of which make it, you know, seem a little bit dated. And it makes me... Do- I mean, it does still stand true, like we say, but it does make me wonder what it would look like with a modern adaptation to it. Um, what, what do you think? What was your verdict? Yeah, I mean, yeah, to me, it came across as... Because I knew what, he was gonna, what was going to come later. It did strike me as a I learnt how to do these later films because of this film yeah uh, which is true for all filmmakers I guess but it's a bit more overt here mm. um, and you've seen that with um, uh, Michelle Gondry with the famous Kylie Minogue video clip which she duplicates herself four times he did a yeah. Nina Cherry video back in the night yeah. you know the Kylie Minogue one where yeah, she yeah. goes around in circles that's that's Some, Michelle, I'll know. Uh, uh, it's um, I know the one so da, da, da. I know the music yeah. Anyway, um, but yeah, he did a Nina Cherry video back in '97, which was the same concept, but he didn't, okay. he didn't have the effects and doesn't work quite anywhere near right, as well. Okay. Um, but that was a okay. You know, what, I'm going to do it later and do it right. And same thing. So, was not consciously probably going. Okay, I'm going to do a better film than this. But you could see that I oh, this idea of dreams. I, know, I can refine that now. I know that's what I want to talk about. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. how about a monster that kills you in your dreams? Yeah, fantastic. Will one of the victims be Johnny Depp? Yes, it will. Here's some money, and then off you go. Yeah. Go have fun, mm. which is why I still go back to the point that I made earlier on: is that this is why this is a real iconic film in the history of Wes Craven's mm. work. This is a, film, a yeah. turning point. Yeah, right. Uh, there are a few hiccups still along the way before mm. we get to a nightmare. Um, but he's probably talk about that journey. Yeah, um, but yeah, I think, he, I think um, he's probably learning. Horror doesn't mean horrific things. Yeah, it's fucking with the common fears that we all have like Jaws works because we yeah. all have that fear when we go in the water yeah. nightmares we all have nightmares that's right and not knowing if we've woken up from one was a genius twist yeah yeah um, and not being able to wake up from one is a, is a genius twist um, I was going to say something about that and it's going to be, uh, <laughs> I 
<laughs> oh yeah, now Stephen Moffat's take on dreams was really good for Doctor Who, which is his thing was yeah. the Doctor theorizes we've all had the same nightmare, we just can't remember it. I yeah. thought that was a fucking genius idea. <laughs> genius <laughs> idea. Um, he plays a lot with that. You're right. Moffat yeah, he does. has a lot of dream metaphors. He and does, things. and he comes up with very good common. Yeah. things that we didn't know he had that the angels being the classic example yeah, yeah. angels move and you don't look at them like agreed and yeah very good sci-fi tropes um, cool yes. so I would say to conclude on uh, Deadly Blessing this uh, we are moving in positive directions in his career yeah he's starting um, to get into the swing of things feels feels good uh, yeah. Might not needlessly, it might not be uh, as well as other films that we will talk about in due course. But for this particular movie uh, that will conclude our film surgery, um, stick around for our next uh, uh, procedure, which will be on Swamp Thing. Oh yes, I can't wait to talk about that. Which you're joining me on, then? Uh, am I? Cool. Yeah. The big cheese is joining you. On the big that. cheese is joining me. So we hope you enjoyed our discussions. Until next time, we are Anthony Yi. We are poor foul. That concludes it. Goodbye. You've been listening to a Surgeons of Horror podcast. Where's Craven? The early years. Episode four. Deadly blessing. Music supplied by Peter Nezik. For more discussions or podcasts. Head over to surgeonsofhorror.com or head over to our Facebook and Twitter sites for the latest news and updates.